welcome all of you from people, I mean, we have people who aren't from KU from as far away as Paraguay and uh, Georgia. I, is a person from Georgia here? Excellent, good, good to see you. Um, and as close as Kansas State University, I don't think she's here yet, and Washington, D.C. Um, in our historical moment, borders have become a quite com complex markers of the international relations and national identities. Now, after the end of many major empires, the loss of old colonies and territories, and after the realization that the boundaries of newer states have sometimes been ill-drawn by former colonial powers, borders have become the signals of a number of problems and issues and the sites of challenge to existing powers and their efforts to retain control over who lives inside their limits, who does not, what those people think, and what they do to make, to make a living. Increased migration in the post-colonial and post-Soviet eras has represented a particular challenge to existing forms and articulations of identity and social cohesion. As such, they also represent an object of considerable security interest. Today, we have three panels on a number of perspectives on, on uh, migration, illegal economies, and security. We start with a historical perspective and move to responses of existing state authorities, finishing with a consideration of migration and illicit economies. Each talk will be 20 minutes long. We'll finish all three papers and then have the remaining time for Q&A and discussion. We do want to say, um, as we move through today, we want to think about how the papers cohere and might possibly form a volume. That, that would be an end goal. It's not necessary, but we'll be thinking of, in those terms. Before we move to our first panel, I want to thank the people who did the work on, on bringing this conference together. Mainly, the guy standing in the back there, uh, Crease Assistant Director, Bart Redford, Office Manager Bill London, who isn't here, Outreach Coordinator Adrian Landry, our indefatigable student team, Wayne Keaton, Holly Hartman, Ben King, and Jake Parvin. Thanks to the Area Studies and International Studies Directors uh, at KU for their participation and support. Megan Green, who's the moderator of the first panel, East Asian, Jill Kuhnheim, Latin American, Garth Myers, African, and Thomas Heilke, Global and International Studies. A great thanks to our partners at Fort Leavenworth, particularly Foreign Military Studies Office, Tom Wilhelm and Ray Finch, with whom it's always a pleasure to work. We end by acknowledging the support of the, of the University of Kansas, particularly the Office of Military Profession Professional Graduate Education and Adrian Lewis, uh, the US Department of Education Title VI grant and the Army Research Office's grant that have made our annual uh, conference possible. And now we'll turn to our first panel, Migration and Border Economies in Historical Perspective. Red button on the bottom. Um, I'd just like to, to echo what Edith said to, to welcome you all. And, and um, I'm delighted to see such a large crowd and, and Edith, you did a great job in making this happen. Um, I am here to moderate uh, the, the first panel on migration and border economies and historical perspective. And what I'm, uh, my role is, is, is simply to introduce people and keep time. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I gather that talks should be about 20 minutes. Am I correct, Edith? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure I keep the right time. I was, I was once on a panel where, where somebody decided to keep arbitrary time. She was very rigid about the arbitrary time. But it could be 21 minutes. One, one person got five minutes and another person got 20. And it just didn't seem that she was like, absolute. Sort of like basketball reps. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our, our first speaker is Margarita Karnisheva from the History Department in the University of Kansas. And she'll be. Um, presenting a, a, a talk on, entitled The Buryats Across the Borders, Smuggling and Insurgency in Transbaikalia, 1921 to 1929. Um, 
Margarita, who I know um, pretty well because she's, she's I'm, I'm her co-advisor, um, uh, was born in Ulan Ude, a trans Baikal rival station, and the capital of Republic of Buryatia. In 1988, she graduated from the University of St. Petersburg, where she majored in modern history of Japan, Soviet-Japanese relations. Following graduation, she returned to Ulan Ude, where she worked as a translator, a hotel manager, and a tour guide. In 1998, she taught history of East Asia, history of Japan, and basic Japanese language. And then in 2003 to 4, she participated in the junior faculty development program, um, with, and which placed her here at the University of Kansas, which is one of my first members. Um, in 2006, she started the PhD program in the KU History Department, and her dissertation project is a very exciting one on anti-Soviet anti insurgency uh, movement, on the anti-Soviet insurgency movement in trans in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so take it away, Margarita. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Margarita Today in Afghanistan, criminal activities by America the drug trade helps fund an ongoing insurgency. This practice is nothing new. My presentation is on the anti-Soviet insurgents in Eastern Siberia, who in the 1920s used an illegal animal trade to sustain their movement. The illegal trade between China, Mongolia, and the region in Eastern Siberia called trans occurred over a long period of time. During World War I, the Russian Revolution of 1970 and the Russian Civil War it became rampant due to the total collapse of trade with European Russia and the total lack of law enforcement. On the Chinese side of the border, the ever fighting warlords did not guard the border either. The anti-Soviet insurgents raided Soviet Russia's borderland from their bases in Manchuria. They stole horses and cattle and drove them across the border to Chinese markets. The regional Bolshevik government was established by military means and was not able to control the whole territory of Trans Baikalia, in particular its southern borderland territories. I based my project I based my project on archival materials from the National Archive of the Republic of Buryatia and the local archive of the Federal Security Service at the Spill Russian Federation, where I conducted my research on the white insurgency movement in the 1920s to 30s. I found by weekly reports of the Soviet counterinsurgency agencies on the contraband trade on the borderland with Mongolia and Manchuria in the 1920s, and understudied topic not only in the United States, but also in Russia. That's by Gilles here. This is the Lake Baikal. That's why it's called the name Trans Baikal, the region to the east, to the uh, Lake Baikal, on the border of East Mongolia. Uh, Trans Baikal is covered by taiga forests and steppes. Harsh Siberian winters and summer droughts make Trans Baikal a challenge for agriculture, but well suited for hunting and livestock breeding. <coughs> As early as uh, the 16th century, Russian travelers wrote about the flourishing trade routes between China, Mongolia, and Trans Baikalia. In the 17th century, the Russian conquest of Siberia and the demarcation of the Russo Chinese border cut off these ancient trade routes and maintained <coughs> official trade relations be between Tsing and Romanov's empires. However, the local population continued to exchange animals and animal products for agricultural and consumer goods produced in China. At the beginning of the 20th century, Tez Baikalia became a transit territory for the export of live animals via the Siberian cattle, dr cattle drive route from Mongolia to, and Tez Baikalia to European Russia. 
Siberia was the main producer of meat, butter, leather, and sheep skins. During the Russo-Japanese War, the economy of Transbaikalia largely benefited from selling the local products, in particular horses, to the Russian army. However, World War I caused a severe economic crisis that resulted in the total collapse of the trade system. Siberia was cut off from its European markets. Not surprisingly, the crisis led to rampant smuggling when the borderland population bartered their products for consumer goods produced in China. After the end of the Russian Civil War of 1918-1921, the absence of markets for local products resulted in a smuggling boom. Yet during a series of conflicts between Chinese warlords, horses, wool, sheep skins, and leather were in great demand in neighboring Manchuria. Hailar, a railway station on the Chinese Eastern Railway, became the main center for fur, wool, and animal trade. Yeah. Let's go to the insertions now. How their movement emerged. Oops. a documentary showing the anti-Soviet Cossack refugees, Cossack refugees, who in 1921 fled across the Russo chinese border and settled in the region of Barga, which is contemporary Taiwan province of the People's Republic of China. The refugee community made their living by livestock breeding and trading animals and animal products. Yet the refugees not only sold their own animals and smuggled Manchurian goods across the border, but these gangs of white insurgents raided Soviet borderland territories to steal animals and sell them to the Chinese traders in Hailan. Uh, Garmai, 
the leader of the Kuliad diaspora in Varga, and the wealthiest host and cattle trader among the Russian immigrants in Manchuria. By 1929, uh, 1450 Kuliad households, Kuliads are a Mongolian people living in the borderland region of Transbaikalia, they are nomads. Uh, 45 immigrant households drove away to Barga, 18,000 sheep, 300 cows, 2,000 horses, and 650 camels. The local party officials constantly reported to Moscow that the immigration was seriously damaging to the economy of the region. The gangs terrorized communists, members of the Young Communist League, Soviet officials, teachers, and supporters of the Soviet regime and their families. They also disseminated anti-Soviet propaganda materials published by the refugee community in Manchuria. the Soviet counterinsurgency operations in the area. Uh, the combat operations against the insurgents were conducted under the command of the Vichikal GPU. This organization was the predecessor of the KGB FSB, and this agency focused on the creation of uh, a network of secret intelligence agents and informants. They also planned and conducted special subversive operations to demoralize and disorganize the anti-Soviet movement. In June 1920, Felix Dzerzhinsky, the founder of the Bichikao GPU, KGPFSB, this organization has a long history and changed names and its organization was structured many times. Uh, Dzerzhinsky created the INO, or Inastranne Adil, the International Department in English, that directed and administered foreign intelligence and counterintelligence. The INO also worked with the minorities in regions of Soviet Central Asia. In July 1922, this network was expanded onto Transbaikalia and Northern Asia. In order to fight insurgents, the Central, Inter the Central Interagency Board in Moscow united the efforts of the most powerful Soviet civil and military organizations, the Council of Labor and Defense, the People's Commissariat of Transportation and Food Supplies, the Military Council, the Red Army Command, and the Central Committee of the all russia Communist Party of Bolsheviks. Felix Dzerzhinsky became the chairman of the board. It was an all-out effort to stamp out the insurgency. The Central Intelligence Board dispatched to Siberia their plenipotentiaries and reinforced the Red Army troops in the Transbaikal borderland by the CHON Special Task uh, Forces or units. In spring 1925, there were numerous engagements between the counterinsurgency troops and the insurgent gangs. These mountain gangs, armed by Japanese rifles and Russian sword of shotguns, operated into smaller groups of three, five people each and fled back to, uh, operated their, I'm sorry, operated around large villages and railway stations. While being engaged, they separated into smaller groups of three, five people each and fled back to Manchuria. The counterinsurgency operations were also seriously complicated by the fact that the insurgents easily melted with their tribesmen whom they used as informants and spies. The Soviet intelligence agents infiltrated the white refugee community in Hailar and learned that Tafkhaev and Garmaev we are collaborating with the Japanese intelligence. The archival materials reveal that they had established a network of 500 informants and spies in the Soviet borderlands to provide intelligence for the Japanese military missions in Hailar and Harbin. In, in 1928, 
The Soviet secret services arrested Takhayev and executed him. Ujin Garmayev served for the Japanese until August 1945, when the Red Army invaded Manchuria. In 1934, the Japanese Kwantun Army headquarters awarded Garmayev the rank of General Major of Manchukuo Army. He helped to recruit the Russian refugees and inner Mongols into the Manchukuo Army, police, and bodyguard troops. In the summer of 1939, Garmaev's units fought against the Red Army in the Battle of Nomanhan, a terrible defeat for the Kwantun Army that reoriented Japanese expansion on the south direction, Pearl Harbor. The, 19, the 1929 Sino-Soviet border conflict was in fact provoked by the white refugees who in May 1929 repeatedly attacked Soviet border guard posts. By August 1929, this engagement transformed into a border war between China and Soviet Russia. During the war, the Chun units destroyed several white Russian refugee settlements in Barga. I concluded that in the 1920s, the white insurgents organized a criminal cross-border network of illegal export of cattle, horses, and camels stolen in the Soviet borderlands region to Chinese traders in Manchuria. This network helped the insurgents raise funds to continue their military campaigns against the Soviets. The raiders, whom the Soviets considered a serious threat to the economic and political stability of the region, were consistently hunted down by the counterinsurgency agencies. In 1929, the border conflicts became one of the main reasons for the border war between Soviet Russia and China. So, I'm done. <laughs> Questions? Or, uh, oh, we're not doing it yet. We're going to do I think it. we'll do questions at the end of the panel. Okay. Okay. Introduce um, Carlos Gomez Florentin, who I just met moments ago, um, from the history department at SUNY Stony Brook. Um, uh, and he will be presenting a, a paper entitled Contested Borders The Transnationalization of the Triple Foot Frontera, I guess, um, 1940 to 1984. Uh, Carlos Gomez Florentine is a PhD student in, of Latin American history at Stony Brook. Um, he has a BA in political science from 2006 from the University, Universidad Católica de Asunción in, in Paraguay. Um, in 2009, he earned an MA in uh, politics from New York University, <coughs> where he studied with a Fulbright scholarship. His latest book, El Paraguay de la Posguerra, uh, 1870 to 1900 was published by Elector Press in Asuncion in 2010. Currently, uh, he is working on a biography of Higenio Mori Morinijo. Uh, his dissertation uh, deals with the hydropolitics of, um, of the Itaipu Dam, which is owned by the Brazilian and Paraguay, Paraguayan government and the transformation of the Paraguayan Eastern region and the neighboring Brazilian regions. Um. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, let me open by try to set you what is it that I'm gonna be talking about in this place with the, the triple frontier and, and probably most of you have, uh, have some idea of what I'm talking about, but it's, it's been on the news since, I guess, since the 1990s. And a year ago, when, and let me give you a sort of pop culture reference, a year ago when Catherine Bigelow, the Academy Award winner of The Hard Locker, decided to show um, to shoot a movie on the Triple Frontier, basically called The Triple Frontier, which was mostly about money laundering, arms dealing, drug trafficking, organized crime, and terrorism. And she kind of got the attention of major actors like Johnny Depp and, and, and Tom Hanks, but he also got the attention of the people in the Triple Frontier region, especially the Secretary of Tourism of, of Argentina, 
Enrique Mayer and the Paraguayan pair um, Liz Kramer, and they both decided that they would they would sabotage that move in any possible way because they didn't want to be misrepresented by this sort of Hollywood as depiction of the region. And interestingly, the Brazilian uh, Secretary of Tourism decided that they would go all the way with the movie, and he actually he actually claimed that, and he said, and I quote, he said, New York has exploited in several movies, and yet people kept going to the city, and its tourism is stronger than ever. It's just a movie. So, and so this sort of, of dialogue was also replicated at the local level in Ciudad del Este, where uh, sort of kind of feudal type of politicians, a couple has been ruling the city for the last 15 years. And it was really interesting to see how this uh, consciousness of, of transnationalism came into the, the, the debate between them. Because the husband, who has been the mayor of the city in the last, I guess, eight years, before, her, before his, his wife took office, he actually boosted a movie on Miami Vice, which was also about drug, uh, drug trafficking, arm dealing, and, and crime activities in, Miami, in, in Ciudad del Este. But the wife were opposed to the movie. So you have this sort of highly sensitive transnational consciousness playing out at the local level. And yet, when you think about the people who live, like the peasantry, for instance, they are still framing their political uh, struggles within the realms of the nation state. So what I want to bring up today is that these sort of overlapping layers of consciousness that you have in a very conflict er area like this, this sort of triple frontier. Which, you know, I think for, the, for most of the cases, and, and some authors have argued that it's actually more like a kind of um, two country relationship. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. Did, what is it that is going on in this region? Well, I guess to give you some some traits about or some characteristics of, of this region, which is the eastern region. And let me go to the map so you can see what I'm talking about. This is basically the region that I'm talking about. It's over here. And so that's where Argentina and Brazil sort of meet us somewhere here. That's it. Fossil was true on the other side, Ciudad del Este, Paraguayan city. And this would be the eastern region of Paraguay, basically like this piece of the country. Now, um, this region has been growing uh, over the last, let's say, 70, but most importantly in the 1970s to now. And the traits of this development were basically well, the 1966 uh, agreement between Brazilian and Paraguayan governments to, to launch a uh, dam in the region. It's the confluence of the Paraná, well, it's the Paraná, it was a river, so you have a lot of hydro, hydroelectric power that was up for grabs, and so they decided to go for it and create this Itaipu dam that you can see here, you can see here better, which is a, a binational project by itself, and it's the most important economic um, event in Paraguayan history by far. Now, if you think about the cities who grew up like mushroom in the region at the time, when you think about Ciudad del Este in 1957, where, when it was created, it was just a tiny piece of well, construction over there. And basically in 20 years, yeah, so 20 years, I guess, is a good time to say it became this huge, massive uh, city. From It went from about 100 people living there to 150,000, I guess, lately. And, but it wasn't, and, and probably this city, and, and you also had the fossil was on the other side, the frontier is where you, you can get all this smuggling, this, um, contraband of, you know, all sort of tobacco, liquors, electronics, also some staples and, and cattle. But 
basically is a, a shadow economy in a way that grew up of the protectionist policies on both sides, Argentinian and Brazilian sides of the border, and things don't come in through, from China through Paraguay. But it's not only about that, it's also about the agribusiness sector, which grew up in, the, in that region, especially soybean. This is a period of picture that you can see of what I'm talking about. But, and, and this also shows you where soybean is being planted in most of this, this area. So you have the co different colors. And, and so this is the borderline over here. And this is where you have this expansion of agribusiness. So the people who really lead the way in this regard was Brazilian migration. So what you're going to have is um, a massive amount of, of people from the Brazilian side of the border coming in with different backgrounds, some of them with some German background, um, but most people, some people coming from the Rio Grande do Sul area and unleashing the soybean agribusiness, which is important because it's going to create a different sort of economy and it's going to push people away from the countryside. So you're going to have this kind of very complex entanglement of, of well, informal economies driven by this development in the countryside because of the efficiency of this sort of uh, agro-farming going to keep pushing this peasant living with more, subs more sort of subsistence oriented or traditional uh, agricultural methods. And that is going to, you know, they're going to move to the Ciudad del Este and they're going to live in the slums, in the city slums. Another important feature of this development is that the, the opening of new, of new roads is going to be decisive to create this economy. And when I go back to this, and what you're going to have here is like this opening of this road and creating, unleashing these this, um, new economies. And the thing important about this is that in the case of Paraguay and, and why it becomes such, such a contested region, I guess, is because of the previous economic arrangements were more like centered in this part of the country and, and using mostly of the rivers, basically. This is a river, Paraguay River. It's the Paraná River. And let me show you. Also, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that you have this country located in this part and now moving eastwards. And you want to have the same kind of movement in this part of Brazil. And so the boundaries are going to really get blurred. And this, I think, it shows how the changes really were effective because we're talking about um, a country connected to the outside world by, by waterways. So this is Asuncion here, and this used to be the main line out of the country through the Paraná River and then to the River Plate region. It's Buenos Aires is here. And so from here, this economy connected to the world. So as you can see, it's a landlocked country. And by opening these ways over here, they expanded toward the Brazilian side. So you're going to have two different econo economies pushing people and in integrating the Paraguayan economy, moving from this kind of entanglement to more like the Paraná region in Brazil. So this is where it's going to go. Uh, and so you have the integration of economy and you have the, the roads. All the roads are going to, which I mentioned before, going eastwards, where kind of didn't or weren't fully developed in the previous arrangement, where you have more like a sort of waterways and railroads and and I guess the uh, you have also the exploitation of forests and so you have this would show you how expansion is going to expand over the forest and sort of an exhaustion of the forest <coughs> on the other side the central part of the country but let me get there by explaining what what the difference are between this new arrangement and the previous arrangement so I guess if the peasantry, and I'm talking about major or uh, uh, 
based on organization like the MSNOG or the, or the, which basically occupy lands and and attacks the, the these Brazilians, which are called Brasiwayos, which is a, a moniker mixing Brazilian and Paraguayan, that would be Brasiwayos. And if they address their their fights in sort of nationalist terms, opposing this sort of transnational consciousness, where well, you can see that the problems should be set up or should be understood in a in a broader level or in a more complex sort of way, is because this expansion, this moving of the center of the country to the east side of the country, was in a way driven by the state. And well, how, how was driven by the state? If, if, if you go back in time and you trace all these changes from the 1980s to the 1940s when kind of started, you have that the state opened these roads to sort of break this this stronghold that the Argentina had over the Paraguayan economy. And the peasantry, I guess, when had to sort of move from an economic regime to a different one. And if you think about how was this previous more central economic regime, you can see that it was basically um, a sort of uh, enclave economy, as they are called. Uh, you have a lot of extractive industries working on the on the, Par the Paraguay River in this area. I mean, also all the way here, but most important in this area, and this also in the Chaco region, which is the western part of the country. Um, and so they they were connected by waterways and railroads, right? And they were also, uh, besides being, well, what, what I mean by enclave economies is that they were basically exploitation of Yerba Mate fields, which is uh, sort of Paraguayan tea, and it was very popular at the time. And even now in, in the southern corn, it became kind of more global recently, but not so much, not as successfully as coffee or tea. Also the extraction of tannin uh, from quebracho trees, which took place in the in the Chaco region and were basically set up to exploit the forest. Company towns built all around the, like Puerto Pinasco, for instance, one of them. And you can think of, of Puerto, uh, all these one, well, some that are not in the map, like Puerto Sastre and a number of them. And they were also exploiting cattle in, the, in all that region and some extraction of timber and woods as I was saying. So what you have there is a sort of economic model that didn't really integrate the peasantry, but like um, sort of cheap labor force. And this economy was most, most significantly uh, Anglo of, well, foreign capital of Anglo-Argentinian origins. And that's probably lasted from the 1880s to the 1950s. And what created was a sort of really uneven government because they weren't able to really uh, deliver any sort of goods. They were constrained by the by by these powerful economic enclaves in the city, I mean around the country. And so it was a sort of crippled state. And when you think about this new model where you have the sort of intervening state creating roads and opening and opening new regions of for colonization, you probably as a peasant you probably had the expectation that this new opening from nineteen sixty to nineteen eighties were going to be for your benefit. But that wasn't the case because similar conditions and the and economic development of, of large agribusiness companies in the across the border in Brazil started pushing people away, especially mid-side farmers, to the Paraguayan side. So when you had this confluence of people coming from the other side, which, you know, they were, I guess, 100 to 200 hectares kind of, or well, 50 to 200 kind of hectares um, size farmers, they really took advantage of the opportunity. But they also didn't have much chance. And so you have a state-led new development, but you also have a uh, people taking advantage which were not supposed to belong in that state. 
and in this sort of uh, what state led which was not completely true when you think that the people who lend them the money to build this road were Argentina and Brazil and the most importantly the US government, you kind of have this state that claims to be national and claims to be create a new region for the people but who actually couldn't afford that. It was just an encounter or sort of, sort of happy coincidence that created this new situation. But the peasantry yet keeps trying to push in so to fight these struggles between the realms of the national state. And I guess, <clears throat> just as a, what I find that is the problem about this region is that even though you have this binational or massive binational uh, development here or the triple frontier <laughs> region, and when addressed at the commercial level, you kind of have the feeling that they have the sense of transnationalism, that they have to develop this new ways to address problems of security or borders or, or what is going on in that region, um, you kind of have to think about new ways to deal with that even at the, at the realm of politics because basically what happened on the, across the border, it also happened within your borders when you have similar you know, soil conditions, similar forests, similar waterways. So it's, it's, it's a huge entanglement that you can't really break easily and you won't just draw on it with some political decisions, I guess. And the most interesting the late, later development, I guess, that you can see is that you started to see some transnational takes on, on the borderlands, which regards mostly to environmental initiatives lately, in the, especially recently. And some authors have argued against this view, claiming that, you know, it's like a sort of uh, globalized take on the borderlands which benefits mostly the, the huge power in the region. And what, what I'm talking about here is a sort of an um, Atlantic forest conservationist initiative that created a, a common, a shared area here that connects all the people, or, or the mammals, basically, mammals, and running from the tri triple frontier region, Argentina, Brazil, and, and Paraguay. And I guess, if we could do that for, for mammals, we probably should try to get a new, a new a sort of similar agreement to deal collectively with what is going on in that region. And that probably is gonna solve this problem and, and you have this even peasant um, concerns addressed in a more um, consistent way. Thank you. Top secret. And then I show you the document. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, that guy, yeah. so relations were not very good there for a while. And then uh, 